안녕하세요. 네, 소개 해 주셔서 감사합니다. 저 소개해 주신 것처럼 저는 코넬 대학교 세리온 랩에서 공부하고 있는 허윤하라고 합니다. 먼저 발표를 하기에 앞서서 이렇게 제 연구 결과를 같이 소개할 수 있게 웹이나 자리를 마련해 주신 브릭 관계자 분들과 이렇게 시간을 내서 참가해 주신 여러분들께 감사의 인사를 전하고 싶습니다. 오늘 발표는 그 대화줄기세포의 만능성 유지 기전에 관한 연구입니다. 네, 앞으로 이제 이후 진행된 슬라이드의 경우에는 그 발표의 접근성과 용어의 통일성을 위해서 영어로 진행을 하도록 하겠습니다. 네. <웃음> so, um, this is a cartoon of a blastocyst stage embryo. So embryonic stem cells are derived from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst, which is surrounded by a layer of cells called trophoblast. So these stem cells are considered pluripotent, which means that they can differentiate into virtually any cell types in the body, including muscles, nerves, bones, kidney, or liver. The important thing here is that the pluripotency of the stem cells has to be tightly regulated. When these stem cells lose their pluripotency too early, or if their transition into a differentiated cell type is delayed, the whole process of embryo development can be ruined. However, um, despite such importance, how these stem cells maintain their pluripotency, especially under the physiological condition, until the right time when they begin differentiation is still poorly understood. And here I would like to suggest extracellular vesicles as one potential mechanism that the embryonic stem cells use to achieve this goal and maintain their stemness. So extracellular vesicles are a unique form of cell-to-cell -cell communication which involves the ability of cells to generate and release the vesicular structures into the extracellular space. These vesicles are divided mainly into two subclasses based on their size as well as their biogenesis. Microvesicles are generated by the direct outward budding of the plasma membrane and then are released to the extracellular space. Whereas as for the exosomes, multivesicular body, including uh, intraluminal vesicles, are trafficked to the plasma membrane and then fused with the membrane to release their content, including the uh, exosomes, again, into the extracellular space. So for your reference, I will abbreviate microvesicle as MV throughout my talk. So both of these classes of vesicles uh, are known to contain a variety of bioactive cargo, uh, including various proteins such as growth factors, extracellular matrix proteins, cell surface receptors, signaling proteins, as well as RNA transcripts, or even the fragment of genomic DNA, which are not conventionally thought to be secreted by the cell. Once generated by the cells, these vesicles engage the cargo and transfer them to the uh, neighboring cells. And when these cargos are delivered, they can cause several different phenotypic changes in the recipient cells, some of whose examples include the growth, uh, increase in the growth, survival, or the migration of the cell. So including our lab, many groups have been studying the biogenesis, roles, or effects, or pretty much every aspect of extracellular vesicles, mainly in the context of cancer biology. And this is the picture of an aggressive brass cancer cell, MDA-MB231. And I hope you can appreciate that in the picture, there are some vesicular structures on the surface of the cells, which are pointed with the white colored arrows. And these are the vesicles being produced by this cancer cell. Likewise, cancer cells are capable of generating a large quantity of extracellular vesicles. One interesting fact is that when these cancer cell-derived vesicles are transferred to the normal cells, 
uh, they can induce the characteristics of a transformed cell, a tumor-like cells in these recipient cells, increasing their survival and growth, and even inducing the cell transformation, which can help promote the cancer and tumor progression. However, there has been recently growing appreciation that extracellular vesicles are not only involved in the pathological processes, but also can play an important role in the physiological context. And one of the good examples could be early development. Here, the study has been done by the previous grad student in our lab. Dr. Laura Droshe, and what she has found was that just like cancer cells, embryonic stem cells are also capable of generating large quantity of microvesicles, which are larger uh, class of extracellular vesicles. And what she has found was that when these uh, stem cell derived microvesicles are transferred to the trophoblast, which are located on the surface of the blastocyst, they can promote the migration of these trophoblasts. And she has also found that this can, in turn, this promotion of migration, in turn, help promote the implantation process, which is an early step of pregnancy where the embryo attaches and invades into the uterus. So with this interesting finding, we wanted to ask one more question to these vesicles and ask test whether these vesicles can uh, mediate the communication between the stem cells and other cell types uh, besides a trophoblast within the blastocyst in the physiological condition. So the other cell type that I was interested in in particular was embryonic stem cells themselves. So in other words, I wanted to test whether the vesicles could mediate the communication between the embryonic stem cells, and in particular, whether these communications can help maintain the stem cell-like phenotypes of the recipient cell. And this idea is just based on the fact that I showed you in the previous slide that the cancer cell-derived vesicles can induce the cancer-like phenotypes in the recipient cell. And to test this idea, this is a very brief scheme of the approach that I used. Uh, I collected both classes of extracellular vesicles, microvesicles, as well as exosomes, and cultured them with the stem cells in a differentiating condition. So in this differentiating, differentiating condition, the stem cells will undergo a spontaneous differentiation. And this was again to determine the effects of vesicles in helping maintain the stemness of the recipient stem cells, even when they are cultured in such harsh condition and are exposed to the differentiating stimuli. So throughout the talk, I will name the differentiating condition as N2B27 medium, and I use a TWI plus lip medium as a control culturing condition for the stem cells where each of the cell could maintain their pluripotent state. So first, with this approach, I looked into the expression of pluripotent markers. The main markers that I used were OCT3, 4, and NANAG. The first lane represents the cells maintained in TWI plus lip media, where the cells maintain their pluripotent state and express both stem cell markers to a great extent. And next four lanes are the cells in N2B27, again differentiating medium, without and with various combinations of vesicles isolated from pluripotent stem cells. And here, as shown in this lane, when the cells were cultured in this N2B27 differentiating medium for up to five days without any additional treatment, the cells differentiated and lost their marker expressions. And upon the differentiation, the epigenetic changes also occurred within the cells, as shown with the upregulation of trimethylation level of lysine 3 in uh, histone 3 in lysine 27. In contrast, when the same cells in the same condition were added with the vesicles, either microvesicles, exosomes, or with both of them, the cells again express these markers, and the epigenetic changes which indicated the differentiation didn't happen in these cells. This could be also confirmed with the immunofluorescence staining as shown in the figure B. 
the most upper lane represents the cells in twice plus lip medium, where almost every single cell is still expressing the stem cell markers and maintain their pluripotent state. And lower two lanes are the cells in N2 to the 27 median. And here, without any treatment, again, the cells differentiated and lost these marker expression. Whereas when they are cultured with the pluripotent stem cell derived vesicles, still quite a good portion of them, even though not all, but still quite a good portion of the cells are expressing these markers as shown with these pictures. Next, I performed a spear formation assay. And spear formation assay is a commonly used readout to evaluate the stemness of the cells. And this is based on the characteristics of a uh, stem cell like cells, such as pluripotent stem cells or progenitor cells, to form spheres under a certain condition. These are the pictures of spear formation assays performed with the cells in NTB27 differentiating medium without and with diverse combinations of stem cell derived vesicles. Again, very consistently, the cells in this condition, when they are cultured for up to five days in this condition, they differentiated and lost their sphere forming ability and stayed mainly as single cells as shown in this picture. In contrast, when they were added with the microvesicles, exosomes, or with both of them, to a certain extent, the cells could still retain their sphere forming ability. And for your reference, when these two classes of vesicles were combined together, it caused the additive effect generating more vesicles, I mean more spheres with larger size. The mm. next readout that I used to evaluate stemness of the cell was alkyl phosphatase activity assay or AP activity assay. So AP activity assay is another very widely used readout for evaluating stemness of the cells. And high AP activity is considered to be a marker for pluripotent stem cells. And in this study, I used a kit that can stain the cells into red color when they're positive for AP activity. So again, these are the pictures of cells in NTB27 medium without and with vesicles. Again, very consistently. Uh, the untreated cells differentiated and lost their AP activity, which is a characteristic of stem cell-like cells, as shown with the lack of red color. Versus when they were cultured with the vesicles, they could still retain their AP activity as shown with the red color. So all the experiments, all the results that I've shown you so far were done with an established embryonic stem cell line in, in vitro condition. So since I personally was very excited about what I saw, um, I wanted to go one step further and ask whether this could be the case even in the condition where they mimic the physiological condition even more. So this time, instead of using the established embryonic stem cell line, I isolated the blastocyst stage embryo from the mouse and try to test whether the vesicles could impact uh, the pluripotency or the stemness of the cells within the inner cell mass. So this time the blastocysts were again cultured in the differentiating NTB27 medium without and with vesicle. And as I mentioned in the introductory slide, inner cell mass is where the embryonic stem cells are derived from. So they are originally pluripotent. So this time we wanted to test whether the vesicles could impact these cells as well. So once I culture the blastocysts on the plate, they will attach on the plate and open up and spread out so that the cells within the blastocysts and within the inner cell mass could also have a contact with the vesicles contained in the medium. So with this approach, I performed the immunofluorescence staining, and these are the pictures that I could get. The upper lane uh, represents the blastocyst in NTB27 medium without any treatment, and most of the cells within five days lost stem cell marker expressions. However, when they are cultured with the pluripotent stem cell derived vesicles, I, could, I hope you can appreciate that the cells located within the inner cell mass are still expressing the markers to a great level. 
Additionally, the ability of the stem cell derived vesicles in helping maintain the stemness could be shown with the in vivo approach called blastocyst microinjection. Blastocyst microinjection is a more strict way of evaluating pluripotency of the cells, and this involves the injection of the cells into the blastocyst stage embryo. If the injected cells are pluripotent, they can incorporate into the inner cell mass of the blastocyst and will give rise to a chimeric animal. To do this assay, I first cultured the cells in Twi plus lymph medium, uh, where the cells are maintaining their pluripotent state as a positive control. And alongside with it, I culture them in NTB27 differentiating medium with the vesicle treatment so that I can test the vesicle's impact in the pluripotency. So each of this group was injected into the blastocyst, and then the blastocysts were surgically implanted into the uterus of the mice. After POPs were born, the ability of the injected cells to incorporate into the inner cell mass, in other words, their pluripotency, could be read out by the coat color of the POP that were born. Um, specifically, if the cells successfully incorporated, they will give rise to a chimeric mouse with the white and black mixed coated, uh, coated color. Uh, versus the lack of integration will yield the white only coated mice. So this is the picture of a uh, of mice that were actually born, and with this approach, I could show that the cells themselves maintained in twelve plus lip medium incorporated at a rate approximately of eighty percent. And even when the cells were cultured in N to the twenty seven differentiating medium. If they are cultured with the vesicles isolated from pluripotent stem cells, they show the incorporation rate of 75%, which is comparable to the positive control. So collectively, these show that stem cell derived vesicles can indeed help maintain the stem cell like characteristics of a stem cells, even when they are exposed in the differentiating condition. So we wanted to ask the logical next question, then what are the mechanisms? How the vesicles mediate these outcome and help maintain stemness? So I personally uh, first suspected that the transfer of core stemness protein, either the RNA transcripts encoding this protein is responsible for this process. However, unfortunately, the Western blood analysis performed on the microvesicles as well as exosomes isolated from embryonic stem cells show that they contain almost undetectable level of any of these core stem cells proteins. Therefore, I excluded the possibility of the transfer of the stem cells protein at this point. Uh, the same was true for the RNA transcripts associated with the microvesicles because the RT-PCR performed on the microvesicles show that uh, they didn't contain a detectable level of the RNA transcripts. In contrast, exosomes were found to contain a great deal of RNA transcripts encoding the stemless proteins with the exception of SOX2. Interestingly, when these exosomes were treated with RNAs, it caused a significant degradation of RNA transcripts, which suggests that the RNA transcripts are associated on the surface, outer surface of the vesicles, not loaded within the lumen of vesicles. So when these exosomes treated with RNAs were used to uh, culture treat the cells in NTB27 medium, if you see the last line over here, even though they didn't contain the RNA transcripts, they were just as efficient as control exosomes, which contain the RNA transcripts in helping maintain the stem cell marker expression, if you compare the lane two and lane three. So collectively, these indicate that the transfer of either core stemness protein or the RNA transcripts encoding these proteins cannot explain these phenotypic changes caused by the vesicles. 
Therefore, at this point, I had to switch the focus a little bit, and I decided to test whether the stem cell vesicles can activate the signaling proteins in the recipient cell. The reason why I tried to test this hypothesis or this idea was because previously it has been shown that extracellular vesicles isolated from aggressive cancer cells can stimulate the signaling events in the recipient cell to mediate the phenotypic changes. And with such idea, I saw the change in FAC. So FAC stands for focal adhesion kinase, and it's one of the cytosolic kyrosin kinases involved in various cell responses, such as cell adhesion or cell migration. And here in this plot, the phosphorylated FAC is the activated form of FAC. And as shown in this plot, treating the stem cells in NTB27 medium with diverse combinations of microvesicles and exosomes from stem cells for as little as one hour or for as long as five days, both strongly activated back in the recipient cell. And interestingly, the level of phosphorylated FAC, again, the activated form of FAC, was relatively high in the cells maintained in twi plus lip medium and were pluripotent. However, when these cells were cultured in N to be 27 medium and differentiated, the level of phosphorylated FAC was dramatically downregulated, which led us to suspect that FAC might be playing an important role in the maintenance of stemness. And indeed, suppressing FAC activation was sufficient to cause the differentiation of the stem cells. So in lane two, is as the cell cultured under the condition where the FAC inhibitor was treated. And with, under this condition, the cells lost their stem cell marker expression, as well as their sphere forming ability, as shown with a picture over here. So while these suggest that the FAC activation might uh, be an important factor in the maintenance of stemness, we wanted to test whether the vesicles are using the same mechanisms. In other words, whether the ability of the vesicles in helping maintain stemness is mediated by the FAC activation. So I again culture them, culture the stem cells in NTB27 medium to test this idea without and with vesicles. But this time, its group was divided into two subgroups, one being control, where there was no additional treatment, and the other was the cells cultured under the condition where the fact was suppressed with an inhibitor. And I looked into the expression of marker, stem cell marker NANAC, and here I hope you can appreciate that the ability of the vesicles in helping maintain the nano expression was significantly decreased under the condition where the fat was suppressed. This could be further confirmed with the sphere formation assay. And again, these are the numbers of spheres being formed uh, with the cells cultured in N2D27 medium. As previously mentioned uh, in earlier slides, even when the cells are cultured in such differentiating condition, when they are added with the vesicles isolated from pluripotent stem cells, they could still maintain their sphere forming ability to a certain level as shown with the gray colored bar. However, under the condition where the fact was suppressed, the vesicles were no longer able to maintain, help maintain the sphere forming characteristic. So since these suggest that FAC activation, the ability of the vesicles in activating FAC is at least partly uh, responsible for their impact in the maintenance of stemness, we wanted to find the key cargo based on this finding. So logically, the key cargo should be the one that is associated with the vesicles, but also can activate FAC. So with that idea, we found fibronectin could be one potential candidate. So here in this plot, we could show that the whole cell lysate isolated from embryonic stem cells, pluripotent embryonic stem cells that were maintained in twi plus lip medium, as well as microvesicles 
and exosomes isolated from these cells contain a great deal of fibronectin. In contrast, the levels of fibronectin in the whole cell lysates, as well as correspondingly in microvesicles and exosomes, were dramatically downregulated when the cells were have been cultured in N2B27 medium and therefore had undergone differentiation. When these vesicles isolated from differentiated cells and also lacked fibronectin were used to treat the cells in N2B27 medium, if you see the last line over here, they were not able, they were not capable of activating and maintaining the stem cell marker expression, unlike the control vesicles isolated from pluripotent stem cells that were isolated from the cells in a cultured in 2i plus left medium, which represented, which is represented in lane. So, so fibronectin is an extracellular matrix protein, which is known to bind the integrin receptor to activate back. So based on this previous information and our finding in the previous slide, I set the hypothesis that the fibronectin associated with the vesicles from stem cells binds the integrin receptor located on the surface of the recipient stem cells to activate back which can help maintain stemness. To test this hypothesis, I used RGD peptide. So RGD peptide can block the interaction between the fibronectin and integrin receptor. So using the RGD peptide, I again culture the cells in N2B27 medium without and with vesicles from pluripotent stem cells. Uh, very consistently, again, I used one group as a control without any additional treatment, and in other group, I cultured the cells with the RGD peptide so that the fibronectin cannot bind the integral receptor. So here, as you can see, under the condition where the RGD peptide was treated and therefore the fibronectin cannot fully function, the ability of the vesicles in helping maintain the stem cell marker expression was significantly decreased and they could not uh, fully function and mediate the same outcome. So this suggests that the fibronectin is the key player associated with the vesicles to activate back to mediate this uh, process. So based on all these findings, this is the model that I have. We could show that embryonic stem cells are generating a large quantity of both microvesicles and exosomes and use these vesicles to, as a tool to communicate with surrounding stem cells to maintain their pluripotent state until the right time especially in the physiological condition where they, they begin differentiation by receiving the external signal uh, to differentiate. Among a variety of bioactive cargo associated with the vesicles we found, the fibronectin is one key player uh, in this context by engaging integrins in the recipient cells to activate back so that they can maintain the pluripotency. So we expect that this study will help us to have a better understanding of how the stem cells regulate the cell fate, their cell fate, which can help us again to promote the efficiency of the stem cell therapy in regenerative medicine. So this is the end of my talk. I would like to thank all the members from our lab, our Sirion lab, for all their help, and especially my PI, Dr. Rick Sirion, for letting me work on the project that could excite me. And also, I would like to send a special thank to my mentor, Dr. Mark Antonia, for all his help. And with that, I would also like to thank you for listening to my talk and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.